It says this. There we go. But as it is written, let's read this together. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10 says, But God hath revealed them to us through his Spirit. Now you can't learn. You can't learn what I'm about to teach, what Trevor's been teaching, what anybody's been sharing through your natural intellect. Forget it, George. It ain't going to happen. You can't. It's not humanly possible. The only way we can learn about the Holy Spirit and the things of God is by the Holy Spirit, through this Holy Spirit. So let's ask Him to teach us. Let's take the time to be serious about learning. If people come to us almost weekly and say, I've learned more in this church in the last year than I learned in the last 15 years in my old church. The reason people learn and grow so rich here is because of the Holy Spirit. It's not because of my gift or anybody else's gift. It's because of the Holy Spirit is welcomed here. He's honored here. He is the senior partner of this ministry. Let's welcome Him. Holy Spirit, we welcome You here today, sir. We can't learn anything without You. We do not trust in our own intellect. We don't trust in our own ability to understand. But we submit our hearts to you and we ask that you would instruct us in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That we would know the ways of the kingdom of God and that we would be divorced from this world system that is led by the spirit of Antichrist. That we would be fully submitted to your ways, Father. And when it is discovered that our ways are not your ways, we will quickly repent and change and have our mind renewed to your path. And Holy Spirit, we honor and thank you for being the teacher in this house. Jesus sent you here that we might know the things, yes, even the deep things of God that we may have an understanding of his ways. We pray this in your matchless name, Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. We had an absolutely incredible time here last night as our, our youth got up and shared their testimonies of how God had touched them at camp this week. And every youth that got up and basically every youth that went, you know, we had about 70 teens from this church and then about 30 teens from our other two churches come. And every one of them said the same thing. My heart was hard. And I didn't even know it. I was just going through the motions. And then every one of them said Monday night, something happened. Something happened. Monday night. Monday night was the night of what we call visitation. Monday night was the night that our guest minister, Chris, got up. He taught our children what it means to be separate to God. And our kids, most of them, were not in agreement with the message, but they submitted to the message. That's the way most of us are. Our flesh never agrees with God. The Bible says we're in cosmic conflict with the Creator in our flesh. The Bible says the Spirit wars against the flesh, and the flesh wars against the Spirit, so you cannot do what you want to do. But we've got to submit to the Spirit. And if you weren't here last night, I encourage you to get the, get the DVD. See it. Don't just hear it. Get the DVD or... When they get it uploaded, go online and watch it in the archive. But these kids made the statement. They said, I just did what he told me to do at first. He just said, if you really want to be separate to God in your life and fulfill the calling of God in your life, then lay on your face before God right now. And I sat there and watched 95 teenagers prostrate themselves before the Lord. A lot of people don't know when we talk about worship, the word worship in Hebrew is proskuneu. 
And it, here's what the word worship means in Hebrew. So when we say worship the Lord your God, it means to prostate, prostate, prostrate <laughs> Jesus. I'm watching too many commercials. You know what I mean? Too many prostate commercials. Prostrate yourself before God. It means literally, it, it literally, it, one of the Hebrew explanations for that word is like a dog laying at his master's feet. So when we say worship the Lord your God, it is to assume the ultimate posture of humility. And you can get no lower than bowing down before the Lord. And in our worship services, our young people are the ones that are usually up here bowing down before the Lord because their hearts haven't got as hard as yours has yet. And you know, I sat there Monday night and I watched 95 teenagers lay on their face for God and the first thought that came to my mind is, I'd never get 400 adults to do that on Sunday morning because your hearts have been a lot hardened more than their has. They, they haven't been alive as long as you have. They haven't gotten quite as much pride of life as you have. But I ask this morning for each of us to examine our hearts in this area of hardness. Now we've been teaching on this message, the wilderness, how you got in and how to get out. And I think many people have had the revelation in this teaching that you are living in the wilderness. The wilderness is the place between salvation and your physical death. And as we go through these different aspects of the wilderness, we've been in the book of Hebrews. And last week we finished up in Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to look at this real quick. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you have come short on it. I got a, a thing on my uh, uh, computer the other day, a, a thing on, uh, from uh, one of the leaders' things that I get every week, churchleaders.com. And they sent an article out, and it said that the disease control folks, the Bureau of Dis Disease Control in America, the federal government stuff, have just released a fact sheet saying that 25% of Americans have some degree of mental illness and that 50% of Americans will experience the development of a mental illness in their lifetime. That's one in two of you. Now, if I told you you were going to play Russian roulette with insanity being the bullet, but you don't have six chances to spin the chamber and pull the trigger. You got one and two. How many of y'all wouldn't want to pick that gun up and point it at your head and say, when I click, I got a 50-50 chance of going nuts or keeping my sanity? The mind is, a, is an incredible faculty. You know, the human brain is, is fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no doubt about it, but... We've got a mental illness for a reason. Mental illness is the opposite of mental wellness. Amen. Amen. Mental disease means diseased. Amen. You have no ease. What well, says there's a promise of entering his rest. If you don't have rest in your mind, you don't have rest anywhere. Because your mind controls your life 24-7. And most of us have spent sleepless nights in some kind of a crisis or another, whether it's relational or financial, fear-related, hate-related. Most of us have wrestled with the spirits of unforgiveness and, and bitterness in our lives. Most of us have been through a lot of those battles. But there's a promise of rest in Christ. Now watch this. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Speaking of the children of Israel in Egypt 
coming into the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Now, it does not alarm me at all to know that 25% of the world is mentally ill. It doesn't alarm me. It doesn't alarm me to know that 50% of Americans will divorce within five years of marriage. That doesn't alarm me. Why? Because I fully anticipate if a man is ruled by sin, he's going to sin. Amen. I fully anticipate that. And so that doesn't, you know, if somebody walks up to me and says, this guy over here shot this guy over here. I'm like, okay. Well, you know, that's what sinners do. Remember? I mean, human nature. I want what I want. I'll kill you to get it. I kill you. I cut you. I'll take you out to get what I want. That's human nature. That's the animalistic part of man. That's the fallen nature of man. That doesn't concern me. I mean, I'm not alarmed when I hear the things I hear on the news or read the things I read. That doesn't alarm me. What alarms me is when the covenant people of God are mentally ill. They have no rest. They can't stay married. They're filled with selfishness in their own ways. That bothers me because... You're living way below your benefits. Amen. You know, Scripture says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who healeth all my diseases. Amen. And it says, There's a promise to come into rest. Now, I came into rest in 1982. I came into rest. And I've got to tell you, I was mentally ill. When I came to Christ, absolutely. I mean, nuts, crazy, demonized. But Christ gave me rest because I mixed faith and obedience to the word I heard. Amen. In other words, I took it serious. And when the Lord said, do this, I did it. When he said, don't do this, I didn't do it. And guess what I got? Rest and peace. And I came into peace in my life. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. This is great. And you know, there's nothing that breaks your heart more than hearing a person who says, I am a Christian. You know, I, I, I just remembered years ago I was sitting with a, one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever known. Genius level in, in IQ. Genius. Absolute genius. Nationally known. Nationally known. One of the most gifted people I've ever met in my life. And he sat in my office one day and we were talking. And he sat there and he railed. For two solid hours, he hated everything and seemed everybody. The whole world was against him. And I looked at him, I said, can I ask you three questions? He said, yeah. I said, do you sense in your heart that you are the righteousness of God in Christ? He looked at me, he said, no. I said, do you have in your heart a peace passes understanding that even when the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket around you, there's just that anchor of peace inside you? He said, no. And I said, okay. Question number three. Do you have joy unspeakable and full of glory filling your heart even in the midst of turmoil, he said, no. I said, sir, then I have to question whether you are a born-again Christian or just a religious actor. Because the Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And if you're telling me I have no present experience of righteousness, peace, and joy, then I have to question whether you're in the kingdom of God. 
I'm not saying that a believer doesn't have conflict. We, in fact, become the most conflicted people on planet Earth because we have to take stands against people that we know and love. We become the most conflicted human beings, but in conflict, the peace that passes understanding keeps my heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. And man... I want to see everybody experience that. Well, they didn't experience it because they didn't mix faith with the words they heard. And we know that we mix faith with the words we hear when we put obedience to what we hear because Jesus said if you're a hearer and not a doer, you're deceived. And worse, you're self-deceived and the most deceived is the self-deceived. And so he said when you hear these words of mine, Words like, love your neighbor like yourself. Words like, forgive your enemies and do good to them that despitefully use you. When you hear these things and you don't do them, you said you're like a foolish man. Amen. You're in religious brainwashing instead of scriptural Christianity. And there's so many Christians living in an ideal instead of real. One of the greatest books I've ever read in my Christian life was a book by an old fiery Baptist preacher, E. Stanley Jones. When I read the book, I thought, this man was so far ahead of his time, but then I realized there's nothing new under the sun. He was just a man that discovered the reality of the kingdom. He wrote a book called The Unchanging Person and the Unshakable Kingdom. And when I read that book, he said something that has rang true with me for many, many years. He said, most Christians live in the ideal of Christianity, not real Christianity. And he confronted multitudes in his life and ministry on the earth, preached up into his 90s. In fact, he was like 87 when he wrote this book. And he confronted denominational believers for their idealism in Christianity and not having a real tangible experience, but an ideal. That's what we ought to do. Oh, we know that's what right, but that's not what we do. We know the Bible says this, but that's not how we live. Well, I know the scripture says this, but we don't believe that. Idealism. It's got to become real in your heart. And a hardened heart is the first to embrace the ideal of Christianity and forsake the real. And you know, just as our youth, every year we say it, you know, we watch our teens and every summer they catch fire for God. And then they march back in to these institutions where they're mocked and made fun of for their faith. And they're ridiculed and humiliated by their friends. And usually by about October, we're doing CPR on them again. Praying for youth camp next year. And teenager after teenager slipped up and said, you know, I was just going through the motions. And you know, that don't just happen to teenagers. That can happen to any of us. We need that visitation of the Lord where our faith becomes that real again. So he designates, verse 7, a certain day saying in David, today after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you'll hear his voice, maybe you didn't hear it last Sunday. Maybe you didn't even hear it last night. Will you hear it today? Because with God, it's always today. It's now. Today is the day of salvation. Anything with God we put to the future is nothing more than a catalyst to harden our heart that much more. Amen. Pastor Brian says it this way. Hesitation strengthens rebellion in the human heart. Amen. When God moves, you move. When God speaks, you you speak. When God moves on you, you move on God. You don't put it off. You do it now, today. This may be your day 
today. God may have orchestrated. What did it take for the Spirit of God to get you here today? To speak to you about today? And, and the Spirit of the Lord isn't speaking to the person over there. Some people come to church and say, well, I wish so-and-so would have been here to hear that because they sure needed to hear that. And you didn't even know. You're the one here. The Lord put these words in my mouth for the people that are here, not the people that aren't here. <laughs> it's so easy. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You know, we shared last week, the week before, how do you recover from a hardened heart? Well, the first thing you do, according to the book, well, according to the book of Revelation, the church of Thyatira, Jesus gave instructions to the church on what to do. Number one, he said, remember from where you've fallen. If your story is, I used to pray. If your story is, I used to be on fire for God. If your story is, man, I used to work in the church. Remember from where you've fallen. I used to pay my tithe. I used to give, man. And I used to love to give. And I used to love to do anything I could to move the, the, the agenda of God forward in the earth. But now you're more worldly and carnal than you are spiritual. And you're more promoting the agenda of the Antichrist than the Spirit of Christ. Amen. You're backslidden and you don't even know it. You're asleep in the light. And just like the pupils of your eyes, your spiritual eyes have dilated. You're still seeing, but you don't realize you've lost the contrast. And the Holy Ghost is beaming bright inside of us. And he's wanting us to just, like the youth did, submit to his presence so that he can revive us again. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. Charles Finney said it, one of the greatest revivalists that we have record of in the last several hundred years. Shook this nation as many nations for God. He said, I believe every Christian needs revival in their lives about every seven days. Amen. I believe that. Why? Because you know how long it takes to harden your heart? You can be sensitive to the touch of God. The Amplified Bible gives this definition of a heart that is softened. It is sensitive and responsive to the touch of God. That's the definition of a soft heart. It is sensitive and responsive to the touch of God. You can be sensitive and responsive to the touch of God and get busy. You don't even have to sin. You don't even have to sin. Just get busy. Your heart can be hardened. You can have one conversation with a plant What's a plant? It's an enemy agent. It's a human that a demon is wearing. We wear clothes. Demons wear humans. They clothe themselves with humanity because they have no manifestation in this dimension outside of us. And so the spirit, you know, I was just reading this this weekend. Ezekiel, it says, for the spirit of harlotry is within them and has caused them to err. And when you go back, read how many times Israel was confronted for harlotry. We are the most harlot generation this nation has seen to date. In the last couple of weeks, I, I didn't hear whether it passed or not, but they already said it was going to pass. That they have done, they are doing away with the airwave restrictions for nudity and profanity on network television. They're doing away with it. 
because the perverts have stood up and said, we have freedom of speech and you're violating our freedom of speech by telling us we can't throw F-bombs out at 7 o'clock on ABC and show our naked bodies to each other. That's happening today. I can say, I, I just read about it a couple of weeks ago then. They said there seems to be no, I mean, it's going to pass. That's coming. It's already all over the world. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But the spirit of harlotry is within us. And it's causing us to err. That being submitted to that causes hardness of heart. Because the Holy Spirit is grieved when we don't take a stand against the things that are antichrist. It grieves Him. And so He literally silences inside of us. Now, it goes on to tell us that these people hardened their hearts, and He said for us not to do it. And then verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest that anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. There are very few Christians that can tell the difference between their soul and their spirit. Because he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Man, every day I live, I pray that prayer, forgive my debts as I forgive my debtors. And I'm always asking the Lord, reveal my heart. I don't want my heart to get hard. I don't want to lose the sensitivity and the responsiveness to your word, to your touch, to your move. I want to open these scriptures and I want God's word to be alive. And it is to me today. And I give him all the glory for that. But it's not by accident. The word is alive to me. Because like you, I have had times where I open my Bible and it's like, it, it's just nothing happening, so to speak. It doesn't have that life producing power in it. And when I experience that, I know my heart is hard. And I've got to find that combination again. That revival. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent. That means you've got to stop doing what you're doing. And do your first works. That's the third phase. See, one thing that really was cool, and the youth were just a picture of this working. Last night, the youth got up one by one and they said, I didn't even feel like doing it. And then they said this, I felt nothing when I laid on the floor and I thought, oh, I'll just do this. But you heard them, guys. One after another, they said, but as I laid there, something began to happen and I began to feel this pressure inside me and I begin to feel this pain inside me and I sat there as every counselor and adult in the room did and watched these teenagers wail wail shake cry scream for an hour and a half as the Spirit of God resensitized them to His presence. And you have no idea how many of you that needs to happen to because you're so hard you don't even know how hard you are. Amen. Amen. And it's going to take you, whether it's in your prayer closet, whether it's the end of this service, it's going to take that encounter to resensitize you. I had me an encounter just a few weeks back. And I'm telling you, God wrecked. Big kid said, man, God wrecked me. Well, that means that's a good wreck. 
You know, the wreck is, is not negative. And that's a good wreck. God wrecked me. God wrecked me right up in that balcony about 5.30 in the morning about eight weeks ago. God wrecked me for the hundred thousandth time, it seems. I've been having wreckings for 31 years. I have like scheduled wrecks. Because I like you get busy. I like you get wounded. I like you take shots in battle. I like you suffer disappointments and disillusionments. I like you thought something was God and was so wrecked when I found out it wasn't that I had to go back and question where did I steer wrong? Where did me and the Holy Ghost part ways? How did I think I was walking with Him and then found myself walking alone in self-deception? And then when we have those wrecks, it's like Humpty Dumpty gets put back together again. Amen. And we begin to walk in the newness of life. We begin to walk again in a spiritual sensitivity. We're, we're so afraid of grieving His presence. We go to extremes. One young man stood up here last night and said, Isaac, he said, man, I, I would say, oh, yeah, i got to go pray. He said, man, now I, like, I get to go pray. That's the difference. Amen. That's the difference. Remember when you used to say, oh, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, I can't wait to get back to the house of the Lord. That's when you were sensitive. That's when you were responsive. And then you get busy in life. And you start doing your own thing. And you can deceive yourself so quickly into thinking, it's his thing. It's his thing. Where's the fruit if it's his thing? Amen. Where are the fruits? The Bible says that God's ways are judged by peaceable fruits of righteousness. Not conflicted, confused fruits of unrighteousness. Things should be pulling you closer to the Holy One, not further from the Holy One. Back toward the unholy. And so, as we listen today again, we don't have a high priest that can't be sympathized. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. One thing great about Jesus, man, I, I tell you, there in the day goes by, I don't have to repent of something. But every time I repent, he's there. He sympathizes with my weaknesses. I say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He says, I know. I know. I was there. Now, come on. Get up, Dave. Let's go. I hope you learned something there. You won't yield to that next time because now you've tasted the fruit of it. And it's not very good, is it? It leaves a bitter edge on your teeth, don't it? Yeah. Come on. Let's go this way now. I don't have a, a, a condemning lawyer. I told you so, you big dummy. You idiot. I don't have an abusive father that's just wanting to take out his anger on me. If you see that, you have a complete unbiblical picture of who the Father is. No, no. On the, on the other side, it says, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Because he was tempted just like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now here we learn that these people hardened their hearts against Moses in the wilderness. It says they hardened their hearts. And it says don't you harden your hearts like they did. Why? Because there's a greater consequence to hardening your heart against Jesus than even against Moses. Watch this. We'll close with this this morning. It's one thing to harden your heart against Moses. It's another thing to harden your heart against Jesus. Hebrews 10.26 Look at this. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. 
but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Look at this, guys. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much of how much more punishment, worse punishment, do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Man. I don't ever want to insult the Spirit of grace by willfully, willfully committing acts of sin. Now, I wish I could stand here and say today, I've never done that. Never, never, never. No. I have to stand here just like you and say, man, I'm quick to repent. When my heart gets hard. When I go a day or two days or three days and I don't sense His presence, I'm going to run to Him. And I'm going to get on my face. And I'm going to cry out until heaven comes. Until He reigns on me. Because I'm not going to live a life with a hardened heart, unsensitive and unresponsive to the touch of my Father. I'm going to live a life that is very sensitive and responsive. Very sensitive and responsive. But we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Guys, we're reading the New Testament here. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We got a generation that has no fear of God, no respect of His holy ways. Spirit of harlotry all through our culture, whoredoms, like humans. I mean, this is literally like a to watch and to see what's happening in our culture. It's like being in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like living in the days where it says there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody is a law unto themselves. The problem with that is the mind will always justify what the heart chooses. That's the problem with that. Sin can't begat righteousness. Your flesh cannot begat righteousness. It it cannot produce righteous acts. You have to submit to God's word and his ways to produce righteous things. Righteousness produces righteousness. Jesus said, make the tree good and the fruit good because if the tree is evil, the fruit will be evil. And so I want to just today encourage every one of you, if you've been hardened through life, Follow the youth. Get on your face before God and let the heaven, let the heaven's pressure begin to do the molding work in your heart because what they were really feeling was the hand of the master molding a crooked heart and a crooked spirit and realigning spirit and soul to his ways and his will. That's what they were feeling. They were feeling the master's touch as he was reforming a deformed heart and soul. It reformed that which has been deformed through cultural pressures and household conflicts. As our kids today all stood, again, you heard him stand up here last night and say, I thought I was healed of my parents' divorce. How can you ever be healed from that? 
Only if you become a new creature in Christ because you can't fix that old mess. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. If you don't let that old stuff go and completely come into an identity in Christ, you will continue to be a dead man walking. You can't fix what was messed up in your childhood. You can't fix what was messed up in your lineage. You can only become new in Christ and embrace that new identity and divorce the old one and put it in the grave. The Bible says that the watery grave, you were supposed to be buried and you were supposed to be raised into newness of life. So now instead of me going around, boo hoo hoo, my daddy was a bad daddy. I'm saying, hallelujah, I got the best father that a father could ever be. I've got a heavenly father. Because I've embraced my new identity in Christ. I've embraced it. I've embraced it. I'm not going to sound boo-hoo-hoo about what wasn't or what was. I'm going to rejoice in what is and what shall be. And guess what happens to my mental illness? I get mental wellness. Because mental illness is being connected to a dead past. Mental wellness is being connected to a living future. You can be healed. Amen. I was healed. You can be free. I am free. Amen. You can be living in the contentment of righteousness, peace, and joy. Maybe God just picked the biggest fool in the city when he chose me and said, I'm going to take you, Chisholm, and I'm going to prove to the world that I can fix anybody. Maybe that's why he did it. He found me smuggling heroin from Thailand. Where do you find you? He found me standing in a Buddhist temple in Bangkok, Thailand. That's where he, that's where he, he found me. Maybe that's why he did it. Maybe that's why I'm standing up here today. Maybe God just wanted to say, I'm going to show everybody I can fix anybody. Hmm? Maybe I'm just another trophy of grace. How about you? I ain't a trophy of talent. I'm a trophy of grace. I'm not standing in His kingdom for anything I did. I'm only standing in His kingdom because of what He did. Amen. So I just connect to it and run. Connect to it and run. Get the worship team up. This morning in this house, I know that some of you, and I'm praying for you, man. My God, I can watch your lives and I see you cooling off. I see you cooling off. And I'm crying out to God for you. If you ain't got enough sense to cry out for yourself because you're blinded by your own delusion, I'm crying out to God for you. I'll tell you that. Every day, I'm crying out to God. Lord, awaken them again. Awaken them again. Oh, Jesus, revive us again. Let the... The coals of God burn again in worship. But it's, like Trevor said, it's that altar of sacrifice where those coals are made for worship. It's what burn inside of us and now has to be revived. It has to be revived. It has to be revived. If you're sitting here right now and you're like, I gotta get out of here, I get it. I'm talking to you. There's some people in here, you're so hardened, you can't even make it through the clothes, man. You're getting to that parking lot. Why? I gotta get out of here. I got things to do. Really? You missed the whole stinking point. I'll never, ever, ever 
go back to the identification of the flesh. I'm going to stay. I don't care how unpopular it is. I don't care how crazy people think I am. You can call me anything you want. You can call me crazy for God. You can call me anything you want. But call me on fire for the Holy Ghost and not this world. I don't burn for this world. I burn for God. I burn for God. My light is for God. I want your lights to be burning bright. I want you to be a city set on a hill that you can't be hidden. Can't be hidden. As we were singing that prophetic song last night, I went into a course and I said, you've got to come out from among them and you've got to come out and confront them. There's got to be a confrontation of light and darkness in every life. Got to be. Got to be. Because light and darkness aren't friends. Light and darkness aren't friends. <clears throat> Would you just bow your heads with me? This morning, the Holy Ghost wants to resensitize some of you. And He wants to awaken you again to your first love. I told Dennis there, I said, you know, Dennis, I step down after preaching a lot of times and I say, Jesus, can I just be nice to these people for a Sunday? And then the phone starts ringing on Monday. And the reports of lives that are in shambles. And I realize I'm just trumpeting the truth against this crazy culture. And I'll tell you what, if your heart's right with God, this kind of preaching just confirms you. But if you're not right with God, this kind of preaching convicts you. When you're right with God, this kind of preaching don't bother you. It's when you're not right with God, this kind of preaching bothers you. That's fact. And I long for the day when I can just stand up and preach and not have to beg people to get right with God. I can't wait for that day that it's not here yet. In fact, I think it's getting further from us as more Christians are converted by culture than Christianity. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Burn in me. is not burning bright in you today let's just ask him rekindle father the flame inside my heart I don't care if you've been saved a hundred years I don't care if you've been saved a week I don't care if you're not even got saved get saved right now cry out to him right now I don't care how smart you are how dumb you are how rich you are how poor you are 
We all need the fire of the Holy Ghost to be burning inside of us. That's why the scripture says, let your lamp burn bright. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. If you need the fire relit in you, I want you to come. And I want you to pray. this point in the service anybody that says I'm cool I'm good I'm I'm good okay we just feel free at any time you need to to just you know kind of go oh, out wow, that's cool I won't offend you you don't offend me but if anyone here says Dave I need fire I need fire I need fire takes a humbling of oneself sometimes to get that fire just like with the youth they didn't feel like doing it every teenager said man I didn't want to do it I just did burn in me oh Jesus burn in me burn in me let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. You know, this song I'm singing was written by a good friend of Larry and mine. And this song got national attention and was recorded by Hosanna Integrity about 10 years ago or so. And this song was written in this anointing. And you know what the record company said? They said, uh, we'll record the song but you got to change the word Holy Ghost because that might offend some Christians and so they recorded the song and they changed it to Holy One man I don't know what that does to you but to me he's still the Holy Ghost oh he's the Holy One but my God, He's the Holy Ghost. And the day I can't say Holy Ghost in the church of the living God, the church needs to be on her face. I'm not going to conform a song to the church. I want to conform the church to the song. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand with me today. If you're not lying, then stand because I want to give everybody a freedom to go and get on with your day. We love you. We bless you. We thank you so much for coming. But for anybody that just wants to stay and pray, please, don't leave if you need the fire. If you want to just sit in your seat, don't leave if you need the fire. Just want to stay a few minutes and pray. Stay a few minutes and pray. But if you need the fire of God, then pray. You can stand and pray. You can lay and pray. You can sit and pray. You can kneel and pray. But we thank God for His fire. We thank God for His fire. Shut up in my bones, my God. Consume me, Lord, until you make me your own. Burn. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Hallelujah. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Oh, it feels like fire. Feels like fire. Shut up in my bones. Consume me, Lord, until you make me 
your own burn in me Jesus burn in me let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me hallelujah do I got a drummer in here if I got a drummer in here couple of musicians, come on, come on, let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me, mm, my, 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 burn in me, burn in me, let the fire of the Holy Ghost Burn in me, Jesus. It feels like fire shut up in my bones. Consume me, Lord, until you make me your own. the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, church. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. It feels like fire. It feels like fire shut up in my bones. Consume me, Lord, until you make me your own. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire
Father, we begin now to prophesy the fire of God is falling. The fire of God is falling. The coals are spilling from the altar of heaven. The coals are falling on hearts. Coals of renewal, coals of revival, coals of refreshing, coals of strengthening. Coals of conversion, coals of reformation, coals of courage and strength, coals of obedience and sacrifice, coals from your altar. Burn bright within our hearts, Father. Burn bright, burn bright, burn bright. Lord, we're here for the kingdom business, not our own business. We're here to please God, not to please man. We're here to do your will and not our will. We're here to see your kingdom come and our kingdom go. We're here to do what you called us to do. Be who you called us to be. Your words like fire shut up in my bones oh Jesus till you make me your own burn in me burn in me let your fire burn in me burn in me Burn in me, let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, let it begin. Let it begin, Lord. Let it begin with us. Here we are, Lord. Send us. Here we are, Father. Send us. Here we are, Father. Do your will. Do your will. Do your will. Mm. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Burn in me, burn in me, the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Hallelujah. This afternoon there's going to be an outreach on Quincy Park Hill, or Quincy Hill Park, and uh, Elevate's going to be there, and if anybody would like to go over and just love on some kids there. They've already went out and canvassed the neighborhoods. They're going to feed some kids and just preach the good news of the kingdom. So if anybody wants to go out to Quincy Hill, they'll be there from like, well, just a little while till this evening. So uh, 
you know, and I know that that's a very challenged part of our community that needs all the love and outreach they can get. Amen. It's a lot of broken homes and broken families and broken children. So praise God. Let's.